Hello, this is Jack Jackson. Let's continue our study of geometry and some of the foundations of it. One of the main goals of, of my geometry course is to view mathematics in general and geometry specifically as an axiomatic system. In fact, this is one of the main goals of geometry in general. An axiomatic system consists of the four following basic elements, undefined terms, postulates, defined terms, and propositions. Primitive notions is another name for undefined terms. An axiom or ax is another name for a postulate. And uh, propositions have several names. A theorem is another name for a proposition. But these are the four things. You should memorize that. When working within an axiomatic system, we start with some basic primitive terms which remain undefined. They're given meaning by postulates, which are statements which are ex accepted without proof. We define new terms as needed, and we pr prove new propositions based on early results and the rules of logic. Together, this structure is known as an axiomatic system. There are many axiomatic systems within mathematics, but geometries give the most accessible and ex give excellent examples. So let's talk about each of these four elements uh, one at a time. Undefined terms, known as primitive notion of terms that remained undefined. It's fairly self-explanatory. But these terms will form the most basic building blocks of an axiomatic system. In our study of geometry, we take the terms such as point, line, and space as undefined terms. In some treatments of geometry, between and on are also undefined terms. Now, why do we have to even have on undefined terms? You might think, well, why not just define everything? Well, it's to avoid cyclic logic. If you pick up a dictionary and you look at a, uh, defining words, what do they use to define words? Well, other words, right? So at some point, you have to have some kind of knowledge of something to build on. And um, Euclid was, um, was brilliant to understand that we have to have some undefined terms. Knowing that term A equals term B equals term C equals term A doesn't actually define the concept at all. It only gives the concept three different names. I remember when I was a, a little boy, my uh, grandfather would say, hey, you're a corker. And I said, hey, Papa, what's a corker? And he said, well, that's a Jim Dandy. I said, well, what's a Jim Dandy? And he said, well, that's a Lollapalooza. I said, well, what's a Lollapalooza? And he said, well, that's a corker. Okay, so now if you knew what one of those things was, I guess you knew what all three were, but if you didn't know, all you knew that they meant the same thing, at least in his mind. Um, and so um, that doesn't actually define anything. And so because of this, we have to uh, realize that we're going to have to need some undefined terms. So if they're undefined, what gives the terms their meaning? That's where the postulates come in. So postulates are also known as axioms. There are statements that are accepted as true without proof. And we want to think of these as being the basic rules of the system, which describe the properties and relationships among the undefined terms. So that kind of gives some meaning to the undefined terms, even though they're not actually defined. <coughs> so with the undefined terms, and the axioms, we have our foundation of our axiomatic system, for example, a, a geometry. Notice I don't say geometry or the geometry. There's more than one geometry. Uh, we're going to be focusing a lot on Euclidean geometry, but that's only one of several geometries. <clears throat> and so it's the postulates that give some meaning to the undefined terms by telling how they relate to each other. Now, originally, postulates were thought of as being statements of facts which are intuitively obvious to everyone and clearly observable in the real world. But with the discovery of non-Euclidean geometries, our entire outlook on mathematics and axiomatic systems changed. We now think of the postulates as the rules of the game. As we adopt different postulates, we generate different geometries in the same way that different rules lead to the game of spades and blackjack, but just using the same set of cards. Postulates can usually be stated in if hypothesis then conclusion form, if then form. In order to apply this postulate, then one must have already established that the hypothesis is true, 
and then one can conclude that the conclusion is also true. An example of this type of postulate from Euclidean geometry is, given any pair of distinct points, there exists exactly one line containing the two points. Notice that this can be rephrased as, if A and B are distinct points, then there exists one and only one line L containing points A and B. In order to apply this postulate, one must first have established that there are two distinct points, say A and B, and then from there one uh, concludes that there must be a line in existence, it must contain both A and B, and that that's the only line containing them. So L is the only, one and only line containing points A and B. That's an example of a postulate. And that one is true in Euclidean geometry. Typically, there is one, perhaps more than one, existence postulate as well in a set of postulates. An existence postulate cannot be rephrased as if-then form. Instead, it simply guarantees the existence of an object. It just flat out says this thing exists. Um, an existence postulate in Euclidean geometry is there exists a set of four distinct non-collinear, non-coplanar points. Now, for this to make complete sense, we must define what we mean by non-collinear and non-coplanar. But this postulate guarantees that the geometry contains at least four points, all different from each other. That's what's meant by distinct. And with a few other properties that this set of points has. Uh, non-collinear means there's not one line that contains all four. And there's not, as non-coplanar says, there's not one plane that contains all four. Notice that there must be an existence axiom among the set of postulates so that we know that we are not talking about the empty set when we, with every statement, just being satisfied vacuously. So somewhere among a set of postulates, uh, there should be an existence postulate, but the rest of them are really if-then statements. <clears throat> Next, define terms. Define terms give uh, our terms that are given definitions in if and only if form. By the way, IFF is short for if and only if. Uh, and they give the name of the term and the characteristics the object must have to receive that name. Uh, for example, e.g., a ge geometric figure is a triangle if and only if it is a polygon with three sides. So it says, if we have a polygon with three sides, it must be a triangle. If it's a triangle, it must be a polygon with three sides, if and only if. <clears throat> In order for the term to be well-defined, we must know what is meant by the conditions, and they must be consistent. Sometimes you will see definitions written in a different format, but they can always be written as a biconditional, that is, an if and only if statement. Propositions... There's the fourth uh, element of an axiomatic system. They are statements that we prove are true based upon rules of logic, postulates, defined terms, and previously proved propositions. Other names for propositions include theorems, results, corollaries, and lemmas. Some of these have sort of value judgments placed on them or weights to them. A corollary is a proposition that is nearly an immediate consequence of another proposition. A lemma is a proposition that is primarily lose, used not only, only to prove a subsequent proposition. So a lemma is a little, not a, that important thing that's used to prove something more important. And a corollary is maybe a less important thing that follows immediately from a more general result. <clears throat> and sometimes the word theorem is reserved for major results. So the words theorem, corollary, and lemma sometimes imply a level of importance and function. Um, and what we will typically do in my classes is use the more neutral term proposition for all of these theorems, and we will leave judgments on their relative importance to the reader. Okay. Occasionally, then, I, if it's a really big result, I will call it uh, a theorem, like the uh, side, 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 triangle congruence theorem, uh, but it'll also be proposition number whatever. Okay. We must carefully prove propositions using the rules of logic and previously established propositions, postulates, and definitions. A geometry, 
is an axiomatic system consisting of points and possibly lines and planes along with the appropriate postulates, defined and undefined terms, theorems, propositions, and proofs. The most famous geometry is Euclidean geometry, named after the Greek mathematician Euclid. The axioms, defined terms, and propositions of Euclidean geometry were laid out in Euclid's The Elements. However, this is not the only geometry that we will be studying this semester. Now let's talk a little bit about the properties a set of postulates might have. A set of postulates, that would be, you know, maybe two or three or four or five or maybe more postulates uh, taken as a set, can have one or more of the following basic properties. They could be consistent, independent, or categorical, or the negations of those would be inconsistent, dependent, and non-categorical. Consistent. A set of postulates is said to be consistent if and only if the postulates do not lead to a contradiction. An inconsistent set of uh, system of postulates could be proved to be inconsistent, not consistent, by showing that if we assume that all the postulates are true, then these assumptions with the rules of logic lead to a contradiction and lead maybe some of the postulates lead to a saying that that statement is true, but other postulates say that that statement is false. The statement can't be both true and false, so now we have a contradiction, an inconsistency, and so we have an inconsistent set of uh, assumptions. So one method of showing a system of postulates is consistent is to build a non-empty model that satisfies all the postulates. Okay, a, a model in our cases would be maybe some set of points and lines and planes and such that um, all the postulates are true. The most important characteristics a set of postulates should have is that it's consistent. So always a, a set of postulates should be consistent. <clears throat> now the next couple are a little bit, uh, a little bit harder or, or, or interesting to look at. The next one is independent. A postulate is independent of the other postulates in a set of postulates if and only if it cannot be deduced from the other postulates. So a postulate can be shown to be dependent of the other postulates if we can prove it as a consequence of the other postulates. If it is a dependent statement, then it should probably be left as a proposition rather than assuming it as a postulate. Okay, Remember, postulates are assumed without proof. If we can prove it, there's no need to assume it. We just prove it, and now it's a the theorem or a proposition rather than a postulate or axiom. To show a postulate is independent is a little harder. We can replace the postulate with a contradictory <coughs> postulate and show that not only does the model <coughs> exist for the original system of postulates, but also that a different model exists that is consistent with the new system with the modified postulate. So one model will will be true in the original setup, another one will be true without the postulate, but will contradict the, the postulate in question. Sometimes we include a dependent postulate in our list of postulates in order to be clear that we are assuming the postulate in spite of the fact that we could have actually proved it as a proposition. This is sometimes done when the proof of the dependent postulate is beyond the scope of the intended reader. I've seen this done in high school textbooks where they uh, call something a postulate that really could be proved. Ideally, a set of postulates should be uh, independent. Categorical. A set of postulates is categorical if and only if there exists only one model up to some isomorphism for the system. In other words, only one model for the geometry or all models for the geometry would be isomorphic. In other words, isomorphic is basically essentially the same. It preserves all of the, the structure of the geometry. It's basically up to just a renaming of things. We can show a set of postulates is not categorical by generating two non-isomorphic models that are consistent with the set of postulates. It's a little harder to prove that a set of postulates is categorical. 
To do this, we would need to show that any model is an isomorphic to the model we create. Sometimes we want the system to be non-categorical, in fact. For example, the set of postulates which define an algebraic group is pur purposefully non-categorical. They define a general algebraic structure, and any set with this general structure is a group, and any propositions that we prove about groups in general apply to all groups, not just one example. And there are many non-isomorphic groups. We may do the same for some classes of geometries. For example, we will be careful this semester to postpone assuming anything equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate, which turns out to be independent of the other postulates. If we assume all the other postulates from Euclidean geometry except for the parallel postulate, we have a postulate system for something we call neutral geometry. Neutral geometry is non-categorical since it includes both Euclidean geometry and the non-isomorphic hyperbolic geometry. However, if we want the set of postulates to narrow down to the geometry to a specific example, we need the set of postulates to be categorical. Okay, so that to review real quickly, we talked about elements of an axiomatic system, undefined terms, postulates, defined terms, and propositions. We talked about what each one of those was. And then we talked about the three properties that a set of postulates might have, consistent, independent, and categorical. And in particular, we want it to be consistent. It may or may not be independent or categorical. And we'll proceed on with the next video. See you back then.